Buongiorno a tutti. It is such a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank Canador College for the honor of being invited um, today. Look, the two most evil words in the English language for an Italian extrovert are social distancing. Um, I'm a hugger. Being with people is really important. I think it's key to human productivity, uh, and so it's just great to be back live again. I want you all to step into the Wayback Machine and think to the time before COVID. And yes, there was a time before COVID, just as there will be a time after COVID. In that time before COVID, and also the time before the illegal invasion of the peace-loving people of the Ukraine by Russia, we didn't talk about supply chain an awful lot. It's rare, in fact. Think about all of the career days that you had at school growing up. Think about the times parents came in to explain jobs. You never had a supply chain expert. People don't go through school thinking, one day, I'm going to be a supply chain expert like and light up. Can I tell you about the latest in supply chain? But before the disruptions of what is commonly known as the supply chain, we had a crisis in supply chain that will continue well after COVID. COVID certainly accelerated it, certainly shone a light on it, but the single greatest supply chain challenge we face is with the single most important resource in the economy, and that is human resource and talent. 50 years ago this year, in 1972, a group of scientists calling themselves the Club of Rome wrote a very influential report that turned into a bestseller called Limits to Growth. And their basic thesis was that exponential growth in population, economic growth, et cetera, was just going to overwhelm the planet. And certainly we see Lots of elements of that with climate change and the impact, storm damages, et cetera. But what they did not foresee, uh, and which we're living through, particularly in advanced Western uh, capitalist democracies, is peak humanity. Right? They did not expect that with development, with wealth, birth rates would plummet, that populations would not be replacing themselves. And then in fact, you would have massively and rapidly aging populations and smaller and smaller workforces to support them. Back in the 1960s in Canada, there were four people working for every one person retired. In the not-too-distant future, absent some significant changes, it'll be closer to 2.5 people working for every one person retired. And you do the math around that with respect to cost of pensions, cost of social services, demand on hospitals, demand on long-term care, it's massive and it's frightening because it could, in effect, collapse society being unable to pay for it. One of the most dangerous commercials of my youth was one that was aimed around this story that you would have Freedom 55. And quite frankly, if we had a whole bunch more of Freedom 55, <laughs> The rest of us would be slave 25 because we'd be working to try to sustain this system. So the glue, literally, that holds together all of the supply chain, that holds together the entire economy, is actually talent. And how do we get more of it? Because right now, even with the, the threat of so-called recession coming, and it's going to be a very different recession than we've ever seen before, because as of right now, there are one million 
empty jobs in Canada looking for people to fill them. In Ontario alone, that number is some 400,000. It's a massive, massive number. How are we going to deal with that? How did we get here? And the three big elements of that are what I call the three Ps. People, participation rate, and productivity. With an aging population, there is only one way that you're going to increase overall population, and that is immigration. We need more people. Right? I'm the child of immigrants, many in this room, virtually all aside from our First Nations, Inuit and Métis brothers and sisters, are the children or grandchildren of immigrants. And we need more of them if we're going to deal uh, with this peak humanity within our society. But that's going to require a whole host of policies as well, because it's not simply, yeah, build it and they will come, open the doors and they will come and they will be successful. We have to make sure that people who come are set up for success. And so they can no longer have this Kafka-esque trap of ticking all of the boxes to be allowed to come and being chosen to come as immigrants because of skills they developed, education that they have, potential that they'd shown in their home countries, and arrive here and not have their credentials accepted. Right? There's an amazing and important role for institutions like Canadore College to ensure that we can rapidly upskill and look to reassure society that those credentials align with the needs of our economy. And we need that not just to allow the individuals themselves to fulfill their potential, which in and of itself is a critical good that we need to underscore, but also because our society desperately needs all of that talent. And if you're going to bring lots more people, another thing you're absolutely going to have to do is make sure that there's affordable, available housing for them. Right? That is a crucial problem that we're finding everywhere in this country and in many Western democracies. In fact, coming up from Toronto, my wife and I were listening to the radio and hearing about northern communities that are now advertising to neighborhoods in those communities to say, look, we need to bring health human resources. We need to bring more doctors and nurses and technicians into our community but we don't have housing for them, so please consider you know, setting up basement apartments, turning your homes into duplexes, et cetera, in order to permit this to happen, which is really a tinkering around the edges of a problem that is underscored today. We happen to be going through municipal elections across Ontario, and municipalities have the power the single most important power with respect to housing, despite what many will say in pointing fingers at, you know, make it the province, make it the feds, we need money from here, we need... No. What we need are policies that allow for greater density in our existing towns because we want affordable, available housing for newcomers, for young people, for new industry coming to our towns and cities. We want to protect green space, agricultural land, and we want to reduce the GHG footprint. There is only one place on that Venn diagram where those three things come together to a solution, and that is greater density in municipalities. And that requires enormous courage on the part of municipal politicians your mayors, your councillors, your reeves, to make sure that they stand up to the people who 
want to keep things exactly the way that they are. Right? We used to talk about the glass ceiling, and unfortunately still present in, in, in great measure, and women achieving their full potential in the economy. There is an amber ceiling when it comes to housing. And that amber ceiling is the desire of those who already have their homes to lock everything in amber and ensure that it doesn't change. I got mine to hell with the rest of you. I, I live in a very privileged neighborhood in downtown Toronto. I can buy my neighbor, tear that house down, and build a monster home, but I can't turn my house into a duplex because exclusionary zoning prevents me from doing that. Just, just absolutely nuts if we're going to provide an environment where we give young people an opportunity to come into community where we have the housing that we need for immigrants. That's the people part of it. The second is participation rate. Because you can have a population, and if you don't leverage every single element within that population, then the gross numbers don't help you. This should be, must be, the golden age of diversity and inclusion. For 25 years, we've talked about diversity and inclusion as a social good. But in actual fact, it is a social good, but it is absolutely an economic necessity. One of the most hard hit segments of our population at the beginning of COVID were women. Because despite being an evolved progressive society, women still disproportionately bear the burden of child rearing. And so when daycare is not available or shut down, when schools are shut down, women who are caring for children simply cannot participate in the economy. And so we saw a reversion of the levels of female participation in the economy to levels we'd not seen since the early 1990s. 30 years of progress wiped out and coming back slowly, right? So everything that can be done, including and I tip my hat to the governments that are now trying to roll out affordable, available daycare to permit more and more uh, women to be able to fully participate in the economy because we absolutely need them. There is no way around it. Similarly, 15% of our population self-declares with some form of disability. We cannot afford any single one of them to not be fulfilling their full potential, both for themselves, for the dignity that we owe to our brothers and sisters, but also to the necessity of our economy, our supply chains, for that talent that we need to grow. And participation also means ensuring that we are getting people at their best and allowing them to fulfill their full potential. And that means a world of lifelong learning. We, we say the words very often, but we still have educational institutions that think in two, three, four-year degrees, right? And it used to be the case that you would go, you would get your degree, you'd have that beside your name, and that would set you up for a future in the economy. In a world of rapid change, that's not good enough. That's not appropriate. It will not work. It will not sustain the economy. It will not get participation rates to the level that is required because careers will change. The notion, you know, there are famous stories of, of people, and there are just a few of them, like Matthew Barrett that started as a teller at Bank of Montreal and went on to become the CEO of Bank of Montreal. Those kinds of careers are going to be very rare and far between unless we set up a world where 
that training is continuous. I've been talking to deans across North America, across Europe, who are now talking about, yeah, people will pay for a four-year degree, but you know, they'll come for six months, they'll go into the economy, work for a year, come back for another month, go work another year, come up for a micro-credential in a specific area, and micro-credentials aren't the total answer because you need a baseline of literacy and numeracy in order to build on it, in order to train on it, but they're going to be crucial to help people adapt and to increase their participation and, um, and their achieving their full potential. And then the productivity piece, and that's in part this issue of lifelong learning, but it's also about investment in technology. Canada is a phenomenal country. I mean, yes, we, we have our problems and we have issues and we have scars, the deepest of which uh, is the long path that we have to real truth and reconciliation with our First Nations, Métis and Inuit brothers and sisters, but we were given this incredible country with enormous natural resource endowments, a relatively small population next to the most dynamic economy in the world. And we're kind of like the guy who wakes up on third base, hits a bunt, and thinks he's gotten a home run. It's been, from an economic standpoint, relative to just about any other country on earth, it's been relatively easy for us for a very long period of time. That is changing in a world that is hardening into blocks, where we're moving from an era uh, that used to worship at the altar of just-in-time inventory. Globalize your supply chains, reduce your costs, find it wherever, and then bring it just as you need it to a time when, as we've seen through COVID, as we've seen through the reaction and the impact uh, of, uh, of the invasion of Ukraine and its impact on fuel, food, and fertilizer, among other things, that just in time may be a good method for business, but just in case is even more important. We need to build in an insurance premium. We need to make our supply chains more resilient that's going to require some redundancy. That's going to require additional cost, which right now shareholders seem to be prepared to absorb. But as the memory of crisis diminishes, it's important that that be kept up. And productivity will be a key element of that. And I'll give you a quick sense of what the potential prize is for an enhancement in productivity. We at the Ontario Chamber of Commerce measure, we use one milestone for productivity being GDP per capita, right? How much wealth is generated by every individual within the society as a proxy? And relative to Quebec, our neighbors to the east, we generate $6,000 more per capita every year. This is pretty amazing. But relative to the eight U.S. states along the Great Lakes, from New York to Minnesota, on average, we generate $20,000 less per person in, in, in GDP every year. That's every man, woman, and child. 14 million times 20,000 is $280 billion every year that we need to enhance by leveraging our talent through productivity. Think of the hospitals, think of the universities, think of the colleges, think of the schools, think of real economic reconciliation. That's our prize, let's go and get it. Thank you very much.